Well, week two is almost officially in the books. Monday night football is going on right now, but I don't expect anything too earth-shattering to happen in the Eagles versus the Bears game. So, at any rate, I uh, will start by going over some of the highlights. Um, one of the big things that came into play this week is the tight end play. Uh, Greg Olson had a great, great, great game. Um, Jacob Tammy with the Atlanta stepped up. Um, Delaney Walker, he had a really big game. And even um, in Pittsburgh, the, the two rookies, uh, Grimble and, and Jesse James, they, they stepped up and had really good games, really productive games. Um, speaking of tight ends and Greg Olson, that 78-yard catch and run, the longest catch of his career. So it helped me about... <laughs> It helped me a bit. I do have him on my fantasy team, even though I don't particularly care for the Panthers, primarily because they're in my division. Um, <laughs> moving on from that, um, how did the 49ers defense let Greg Olson get that wide open? You have one of the best tight ends in the league, and you're going to let him loose? Hmm. That tells you a little bit about what I think of the 49ers this year. Sure, they shut out the Rams in week one, but put them against an offense that has any type of offensive weapon, and they're going to flounder. I see this happening throughout the season. They've had a little bit rough of a go of it. Um, I don't see them improving much. I actually see them playing more like they did this week versus the way they played last week. <laughs> and speaking of defense, we have our typical top of class. We have the Arizona Cardinals who had a really good game yesterday. And the Houston Texans, like always, with J.J. Watt, they're always going to be a force. Um, and how about Minnesota last night? <laughs> they gave Green Bay fits. Two surprising teams with defensive accolades for this week would be the New Orleans Saints and the New York Giants. They really held the receivers in check throughout the whole game. And speaking of receivers, Kelvin Benjamin is back, and back in a big way. I think his stats are going to be absolutely ridiculous for this year. He is such a big receiver with such fluid movements and fluid hips and big hands that are like Velcro. Um, I see him doing some really, really big things this year. Barring injury, I could see him um, upsetting Antonio Brown as the leading receiver in the NFL. There are also some pretty big surprises in Week 2. Uh, the first of which I want to mention is Jimmy Garoppolo going down um, and Brissett, Brissett, Brissett? Uh, stepping in and like typical New England style, next man up formula works brilliantly for Bill Belichick. He's had that formula down for years, and I don't know how he does it, but whenever anybody goes down, people fill in like nothing had happened. Another big surprise was Sam Bradford. How big did that gamble pay off for Minnesota? In a Sunday night football game where Aaron Rodgers is playing, who would have thought that the largest stat line would be Sam Bradford? Um, if you took a bet on that, good for you, because most of us probably would never have done that. Um, the connection between him and Stephon Diggs was brilliant. And if they can keep that up and Minnesota's defense stay as dominant as they are, uh, Minnesota might definitely make some waves, especially in the NFC North. It might be theirs for the taking. Who knows? I guess these next couple of games will help us pan that out. Um, one other thing that uh, I guess it shouldn't be too much of a surprise, but even after the move to L.A., Jeff Fisher and the Rams have the Seahawks number. In the past two or three years, I think it's since 2014, with last night's victory, Jeff Fisher is 4-1 and one over Pete Carroll. I find that hilarious. 
I guess it shouldn't be too big of a surprise because after playing a team twice a year for multiple years, you kind of understand their nuances. You, you kind of can determine what they're going to do or what they're going to run next. But even um, with all that taken into consideration, just with the move and the toss up of players on both offense and defense, um, yeah, the Rams held up well against the Seahawks and I guess their, uh, their dominance continues. Now um, on to some of the low lights. First, Kirk Cousins is not the answer in Washington. And secondly, um, the Giants and Saints game. If you were looking for offensive fireworks, you were sorely disappointed. Between the two teams, there was only one offensive touchdown scored the entire game. Last year, the teams combined for over 100 points. This year, the end score was 13 to 16. And the biggest play was a blocked field goal that was run back for a touchdown. <sighs> Moving on from that, there were also a lot of bad calls. Uh, the referees, I don't know what it is this season, um, but the catch rule is still up in the air. Defensive versus offensive pass interference. A fumble versus not a fumble. Um, there's a couple of highlights, or there, there are a couple particular plays that I would like to call attention to. Um, the first was the taunting call against the Browns when Terrell Pryor was flipping the ball to the referee and a Ravens player walked in the middle of that toss or that interchange and they called it taunting when it was apparent that uh, Pryor was throwing the ball to the referee and actually let go of the ball before the Ravens player even came close. So that was kind of a BS call. And Ted Jen's no catch that was considered a catch. If a ball touches the ground, I thought it was an incomplete pass. Either I'm incorrect or the rule was not explained to me well enough. So, like I said, the refs either need to work on interpreting the rule a bit better or explaining it more or explaining it better to, to us fans. And um, lastly, uh, of course, I have to bring up one of the BS calls on the Saints, was Moore's defensive pass interference on Victor Cruz. Why was this important? For one, it was on the game-winning drive, just like the BS call last week. Secondly, similar to last week, it was, in my opinion, and probably more than just mine, it was probably an uncatchable ball anyways. It was over both of their heads and the trajectory was not low enough to actually come in, come down within bounds anyway. Thirdly, Victor Cruz clearly pushed off and grabbed Moore's breastplate before the call was made. You can even on the replay see where Moore was actually pushing Cruz's arm off of his breastplate as he was turning to go up to the ball. Clearly offensive pass interference, or so I thought, when the flag was thrown. However, the call was against Moore. Hmm. At any rate, um, those are just a few of the calls. Uh, I could go on and on and on, but that would take way too much time, and most people already know that there's a lot of ticky-tack calls in every single game. <sighs> Typically, they don't determine the outcome, but with these three that I mentioned, I think it actually may have had some impact. One last low light that I wanted to highlight um, are the number of injuries. Throughout these two weeks, there have been a total of 140 reported injuries. Now, I don't know the statistics from years past. I haven't had time to do proper research on that, but that seems awful high. For a 32-team league to have 140 reported injuries over the first two weeks of a season. 
Now, I don't know if this drastic number of reported injuries is due to the rule changes where D-backs are more cognizant of where they're hitting a player or if it's a result of you know, little to no contact during team drills. So you have less muscle memory or exactly what is going on there. I'm not a doctor or a physiologist, so I, I can't really tell you that. But I do know that 140 is a, it's a little bit high in my opinion. Well, that's about all I have time for this week. There's a lot of content that I kind of cut out. I'm trying to get the format of these videos set so I'll know exactly what to talk about, what people are really interested in, and what really goes over well. So please, please, please leave comments or questions or anything that you think that I should talk about or how I should format these videos. I'm open to critique and criticism. Please feel free to let me know your thoughts and opinions. And if you have anything specifically you would like to ask my opinion on, or if you would like me to talk about a specific subject, please just let me know that as well. And um, until next time.